Arzan Quinn was a 28-year-old woman who lived in New York, and she also was a teacher for deaf children. She would often stay after hours with the children, and on the evening of New Year's Day, 1973, Quinn went across the street from her apartment to a bar named W.M. Tweets, where she met John Wayne Wilson. Wilson's friend, Gary Guest, had left around 11 p.m. before Wilson met Quinn. Wilson and Quinn went to her studio apartment, where they smoked and attempted to have intercourse. As Wilson later told his attorney, he was unable to achieve an erection. He claimed that Quinn insulted him and demanded that he leave her apartment, and an argument ensued. After a struggle, Wilson picked up a knife and, according to his police statement, stabbed Roseanne Quinn 18 times in the neck and abdomen. After the murder, Wilson covered Quinn's murder with a bathrobe, showered, and left the apartment. Before leaving, he wiped his fingerprints off the murder weapon, the doorknobs, and other surfaces that he had touched. Later that night, Wilson confessed the crime to Guest, believing that Wilson was fabricating the story in order to get a plane ticket home. Guest gave him enough money to leave town. Wilson left and flew to Miami to pick up his wife, Kathy, and they later flew to Indiana. Quinn's body was not discovered until the morning of January 3rd. The authorities at St. Joseph's School, alarmed that Quinn had neither called nor shown up for work in two days, sent a teacher to her apartment to check up on her. The building superintendent let the teacher into the apartment, where they found Quinn's body. Quinn's 25-year-old brother, John, later identified the body at the morgue. In the days before DNA evidence, there was little to connect Quinn to her killer. No one at Tweed's knew the identity of the man with whom she had left, nor did they recall his appearance. The crime scene had been effectively sanitized. Desperate to crack a case that had been on the front pages for days, the local police department released a police sketch that ran in several New York City newspapers. Unfortunately, the sketch was not of the killer, but was that of Wilson's acquaintance, Gary Guest. Guest was not sure whether Wilson had committed the murder until he saw Quinn's name in a newspaper article. Fearing that he might be charged as an accessory after the fact, Guest first called his friend Fred Ebb and Ebb's personal assistant, Gary Greenwood. Guest told Ebb he said he was going to see them and hunt up. The next day, he told Ebb and Greenwood about Wilson and the murder. Guest said that he had been out with Wilson and left early because he had to go to work in the morning. He said that when he woke up, Wilson had not returned to the apartment and Guest became worried. Wilson subsequently arrived and confessed the murder to him and Guest gave him money. Ebb's called Guest's therapist at ASA in New York, she said that she would contact an attorney and would call him back as soon as possible. Shortly thereafter, she and the attorney called back. The attorney advised Ebb to put guests on the first plane back to New York City. He also advised Ebb and Greenwood not to say a word about what guests had told him. In mid-March, Ebb and Greenwood flew back to New York City. It took more than two weeks to convince guests to talk to the police, as guests agonized over the fact that this information could send his friend Wilson to prison for life or to death row. Guests' lawyer contacted the police and secured guests' immunity in exchange for revealing the location. Detectives were accompanied by Indianapolis police. They arrested Wilson at his mother's house in Indianapolis. Wilson was brought back to New York and was incarcerated in the Manhattan Detention Complex, known as the Tombs. 
After spending some weeks in the tombs, Wilson was sent to Bellevue Hospital Center to be tested for childhood brain damage, which his attorney planned to claim as part of an insanity defense. Wilson stayed at Bellevue for several weeks, but the tests were never administered, and he was eventually returned to the tombs. Although he had been diagnosed as suicidal, the cells for the suicide watch were full, so Wilson was placed in a regular cell on the fourth floor. In May, Wilson got into an argument with a prison guard and threatened to kill himself. The guard taunted him by asking if he wanted sheets to help him commit suicide, and later threw bed sheets into his cell. Wilson used those sheets to hang himself. On May 5, 1973, an investigation was held into the circumstances of Wilson's death, but no charges were ever filed. The case has been depicted or adapted several times, including Judith Rossner's best-selling novel, Looking for Mr. Goodbar, which was adapted as a 1977 film directed by Richard Brooks and starring Diane Keaton. Lacey Fosberg's true crime interpretive nonfiction book, Closing Time, The True Story of the Good Bar Murder. Track Down, Finding the Good Bar Killer, a fact-based CBS TV TV movie, semi-sequel to the 1977 film, starring George Segal and Shelley Hack. The events mostly followed the storyline of the Looking for Mr. Goodbar film, but otherwise claimed no connection with the Rosner's novel. The Law and Order SVU Season 2 Episode Secrets, aired on February 2, 2001, is based on the case. The case is also profiled in Episode 302, entitled Last Night Stand, of the investigation discovery drama series a crime to remember well that's it for now i thought i'd do a little dive on the good bar case it's truly a tragic crime and i remember watching the movie once on turner classic movies apparently the movie is hard to find due to copyrights disputes over the music featured in the movie well, I hope you enjoyed this retelling, and thank you for watching, and I'll catch you on the flip side.